Welcome to the third part of the fifth lecture for 4418. To begin with, on this particular part, we're going to talk about the uh, lead and lag compensation once again, just to refresh your memory. Uh, phase lag and lead controllers that we've talked about before compensate via placement of an additional pole and zero in the system, one each. And there's two comp commonly used compensators, and the ones we've really talked about in here. Uh, then they are the first order lag compensator and the first order lead compensator. The transfer function of both compensators we can write as uh, shown here with the, the zero as you can see there, Z1, and the pole, P1, as shown below. We also happen to have a, a constant gain, K sub C, associated with the compensator in there as well. If the, if the pole is farther away from the origin than the zero, then that means it's a lead compensator. And if we have the pole closer to the, to the origin than the zero, then it's a lag compensator. Remember that lag is aux. Okay, so the zero is farther away. That means uh, all I'm talking about is ox based on the s plane. Something like that. Okay. So, if we take a look at a lead compensator, but remember before we've always looked at lead compensator with a root locus plot, but now if we use actually a body plot, we can see that maybe why it's called lead compensator. The lead compensator actually causes the, the phase to be positive. So if we put this in, in, with, um, in series with the plant, say, then it causes the phase to lead what it used to be without the lead compensator. So we end up with a positive lead. <coughs> the magnitude is as shown here. We have 0 dB at rather high frequencies and minus 6 dB, say, at low frequencies. This is for a specific arrangement. I mean, of course, if we change these values, then we'd end up with different results. But this is just an example. And if we have, uh, uh, as you noted, that it had phase lead because the output is shifted ahead of the input. And the low frequency of response is attenuated while the high frequency response is amplified. If we adjust the gain, as shown here. So for example, if I, if I turn up the gain, then basically all I'm doing is I'm just raising everything uh, up so that I might write 10 and this might be 8 and that might be 6 and 4 instead of whatever it was before. So we can actually amplify the high frequency response and leave the low frequency response alone, say. Right. So here's our lag compensator. And we can see that the low frequency response now is amplified and high frequency response is unaffected. And of course, we can adjust the gain to actually get low frequency response be unaffected and high frequency response be attenuated. It just depends on what we're trying to do. The phase is uh, actually caused to be delayed from the original system, you can see here. And so that's why it's called lag. So this la idea of lag and lead and all of that is all associated with the phase angle. And we use a hat here for the lag compensator once again, and this specific arrangement is given by this example. So the phase shift is uh, where we have output shifted behind the input, uh, that's why we call the phase lag. And the low frequency response is amplified. With a gain adjustment, we can uh, actually attenuate the high frequency response and uh, amplify the low frequency response. OK. So when we talk about adjusting the response via the gain just in, the, in and of itself, uh, when we raise the gain, so we go back and look at the body plot, for example, in a lag controller, just the lag control uh, compensator by itself, if we raise the gain, then we can see that all we're going to end up doing is uh, improve the transient response characteristics, improve rise time, and so forth. But it also tends to lower the overall stability of the system. You're looking to your phase margin and gain margins, and so forth, or your uh, gain margin, I should say, and it drops whenever you increase the gain in the overall system. It also tends to increase the steady state error, which is another problem. And so it's a trade off between the steady state and transient response characteristics, same as it has been before. For looking at gain adjustment via frequency response plot, it's actually quite simple. We can draw the Bode magnitude and phase plots of the open loop system for a particular gain. We have to just set it, otherwise you can't plot the magnitude block. 
And then we'll determine the required phase margin from the specified percent overshoot or damping relation, ratio or, no, or uh, settling time. All these things are fairly closely related, really. And then find the frequency on the body plot that, body plot that will give us this desired phase margin. If we do that, then we can change the gain to force the magnitude curve to go through 0 dB at this particular frequency. So then once we have that frequency, then we'll, force the, uh, we'll change the gain so that the magnitude curve, go, the curve goes straight through that. What happens then is that that means that when it goes through that 0 dB line, it goes through and it's at the gain crossover frequency. And if we match whatever frequency we're looking for out of, out of uh, item 3 here, for this phase margin, and we match it with the gain crossover frequency, we're going to get this phase margin that we're looking for. So maybe it's best by looking at an example. So we'll take that dish example again that we had before with the preamplifier of gain K, power amp, motor and load, and then this uh, integrator. So we'll plot the body plots as a first step. All right, so there's our complete system. You see the 100 is in here from the power amplifier, and we put it all together. We have the three poles, one at the origin, one at uh, minus 100, and one at minus 36. And then we'll, to plot it conveniently, I don't know whether you've seen this or not before. It depends on who's taught it. But um, you will normalize each of the terms. And I'll explain why later we might want to do this. And if you look and see what we've done, we've actually got S uh, divided by 100 plus 1. So we've divided through by the top and the bottom by 100. We divided through by the top and bottom by 36 to normalize here. So we have S divided by 36 plus 1. And then, well, this is already sort of normalized. There's not much we can do about it. The idea is, is that it, instead of having, say, S plus A, we'll have S over A plus 1. And then we went with this 1 here. I'll show you why in a minute. Now, each of these terms are going to give you a zero magnitude as S go equal, goes to zero if we set K is equal to 36. So again, I'll show you what we're talking about in a moment. And this is where it's important. If you look here, if we said that uh, we had uh, 1 over uh, S over 100 plus 1, then as S goes to 0, then the magnitude of this particular function actually goes to 0 dB. If it was something different, then it would actually go to quite a bit more. So uh, let's go down here and plot, for example, the We have 0 dB at low frequency. It's because of the normalization that we've performed. If we have a um, past the break frequency here of 100 radians per second given by that value, then it's a drop of 20 dB per decade. And we'll notice that in this particular system, they actually have a the, the drop in the frequency from 0 to minus 90 degrees at this 100 with the with the 45 minus 45 degree point here at at 100. So this particular point is at 100 radians per second, and this is at minus 45 degrees phase. So it goes from zero to minus 90 degrees phase, and uh, it crosses the halfway in between those two values at 100. On the other hand, if we look at say the the pole at as for 1 over s over 36 plus 1, which has been the normalized value here. You'll notice that as s goes to 0, this is 1 over 1, and that means the magnitude of this will be at 0 dB at very low frequencies. Again, that's the reason why we normalize. And if we look at the phase and the corner frequency, we'll see that the corner frequency is actually 36 radians per second, so 10, 20, 36, so they're about here about as well, so we come out and then drop from here at, at, at minus 20 dB per decade. And you'll notice that it's about at this same value here at the corner frequency of 36. This will be at a phase of minus 45 degrees, somewhere between 0 degrees and minus 90 degrees for your phase. OK, so then once we have all of those, we add these together. And keep in mind that we'll have as well over here, we'll have the 1 over s term to be worried about. If you look at the magnitude, we have 0 dB and 1 radian per second. One of the other things that 
that's important to note here is that when we normalize, we get this. We get 0 dB at 1 radian per second, and that makes it convenient. Um, and then we have a drop of 20 dB, dB per decade from, from that point to the, towards the right. And it's also actually 0 dB per uh, 20 dB per decade uh, all the way to a frequency of 0, which we can't actually plot right, on a log plot. So we just keep going up and up and up. This is past this first break frequency at 36 radians per second, it would actually drop to 40 dB per decade, and then as to 60 dB per decade past the second break frequency at 100 radians per second. So if we add all these all these things together again, we get the phase uh, minus 90 degrees and low frequencies at the, at the left of the first break frequency, and this is minus 90 because of the of the pole at the origin. And then we'd have uh, go to 180 degrees, somewhere between the, the first and second break frequencies, and then go all the way to minus 270, right of the second break frequency. So we notice we get 90 degrees per, per pole, one for the origin, one for the 36, minus 36, and another last one to take us to minus 270 past the, uh, the pole at 100, or minus 100, I should say. All right, so gain margin and phase margin, wonder what those are. Well, we can determine them. The gain margin, remember, we can determine from the phase crossover. And look at our phase crossover, that it's the distance below the 0 dB line at a phase of 180 degrees with minus sign. So we look over here, what we've got a minus 180 degrees. Remember what it, this really is. And when you look at a Nyquist plot, this is what it all arises from. And this is uh, minus 180. 180 degrees or plus 180 degrees, doesn't really matter, it's the same thing. And we're looking for how this crosses over and goes to the origin for our Nyquist plot. So we're looking for what the, where this point is at. Well, that's at a phase of 180 degrees or minus 180 degrees. So we look at a phase of 180 degrees or minus 180 degrees, and it's this value here. And then we go up and look and see what the magnitude is. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to look and see how far out it is from the origin out to that point. And that's what this, this value is here. All right, so the origin is on the magnitude plot is way down at minus, minus infinity and it's coming up to this particular point. Now, what we're actually looking for is the gain margin. That's the distance down to this point from zero dB line that's actually from the minus one point out here to this, this crossover point. That's actually related back to the gain margin. That's what this distance is. So if we look, that's actually 43 dB from, from this point to the zero dB line. So this is a minus 43, the gain margin. If we increase the gain by 43 dB, we could actually drive the system to be marginally stable. So if we go back and look at the phase margin now, it's, it's actually the distance above the minus 180 degree line at a magnitude of 0 dB, the gain crossover. So if we, as we go down we go down and gain, what we're actually looking for here is if this is our Nyquist plot again, we're looking for the response and we're looking for if this is the radius out here at 1, then we're looking at where this point is at and we're going to compute this angle. That's our, our phase margin. So and since this is a radius of 1, that's at 0 dB. So we look at where the 0 dB point is. And we go down and we look. And we see that the phase is, is roughly 88 degrees above the minus 180 de degree line at this particular value of the, the frequency, or in other words, again, crossover frequency. So once we have those, we have the phase margin of 88 degrees, the gain margin of 43 degrees at these two different uh, sets of frequencies. And we, then we'll determine the required phase margin from the percentage uh, overshoot that's been specified. So we've been given this. Okay, so we've been given that value. And so then we're going to take that and then redesign the system we have to give us this result. The zeta then. Uh, can be computed from the percentage overshoot value, and that's 0.6. And this should say uh, lecture three. And so then, if that's lecture three, then we go back and look and see what the phase margin is 
as a consequence of this data, and that's actually from earlier in this today's lecture. Okay, and so the phase margin is the arc tangent of t zeta divided by the square root of minus t zeta squared plus square root of one plus four zeta to the fourth power. That for this situation is about fifty nine point one nine degrees. So that's our phase margin that we need. So all of this stuff, this is we need. And all this up here, this is what we have. So we need to figure out how to get what we need based on what we have. Well, let's look and see where on the plot we have a 59 degree phase margin, because after all, that's what we want. So we say, all right, we go across, and this, this would be a 59 degree phase margin, wherever that is on that line. That's 59 degrees above minus 180 degrees. So we see that there's an intersection here, right there. So that's at 15 radians per second. And what we need then is to actually figure out how to change the gain so that this becomes the gain crossover point. Before the gain crossover point was over here, we had a phase margin of 59 degrees. That's too much. We want the phase margin to be less than that. I'm sorry, 88 degrees. Now we want the phase margin to be 59 degrees. So we're going to move the gain crossover point from over here up to here. The way we do that is, is just by changing the gain of our system so that the, the, res the response, the magnitude of the response, actually goes through this point here. That's a difference of 24 decibels. So we'll have to add in 24 dB to the gain. And that's the response of the system. That's 15, if you actually look at what that really amounts to, the gain has to go up by 15.85 uh, times. So instead of having a gain of 36, we really need a gain of 570.6. And so then we end up with our gain crossover uh, frequency to be here. We go down and then we get exactly what we want. We get a phase margin of 59 degrees. So since our phase margin has gone down, the, the transient behavior should be quicker. And uh, we've had actually no change in the phase in and of itself. We've just moved the phase margin by just adjusting the gain. So this is before with a gain of uh, 36, and this is the response of the system. As you can see, it goes from 0 to 1 um, as a response out of the system. And then when we actually change the gain, you can see that the, the response is quicker. Say it crosses 1 much sooner than it ever would over here. But you'll notice that instead of just going to 1, it goes up here to 16. The steady state error then, as you might notice, is, is much, much larger. It goes up by a factor of 15 from what it was before. You can actually calculate that by going back and look at the Bode plot and then using the things that we talked about in the last lecture, where we have a static velocity error constant, k sub v, and we can see that that would be 15 radians per second um, from, from our arrangements here. Because that's, if you go from here from the left and you see where it intercepts the, the 0 dB line, that would be the value of our, of our constant. It actually went up by a factor of 15. Went down, and this went down by a factor of 15, I should say. Not good. OK, so that's one of the uh, depressing parts about actually using gain to design anything. Um, and it shows you why we'd actually have to go back and use something like uh, a compensator to f help fix things up.